Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to this WBCSD webinar. We're delighted that you've been able to join us today. This webinar is part of a WBCSD virtual event series, and today we'll focus on sustainability in the finance sector, and specifically looking at how we can mobilise capital for a more resilient world. Wherever you are in the world today, I hope you and your family and friends are safe, and that the unusual and unprecedented situation we face ourselves um, is, is something that you are able to, to manage and, and, and cope with. So I'm delighted that, as I said, you've been able to join us today. And um, we have colleagues from our London and Geneva offices, as well as our partners and members from around the world that will be taking part in today's session. Can we go to the next slide, please? So I'm Rodney Irwin. I'll be your host today, along with my colleague, Joss Tantrum. And together we will be giving some background information to today's event, as well as moderating today's uh, exciting panel discussion. Next slide, please. And our panelists today are um, well, well known in their respective fields and bring an, an element of expertise that is vital for this uh, webinar to be as informative as we hope it will be. So we're delighted to, to welcome Alexander Burr, Carmen Nuzo, Jose Luis Blasco and Mike Terrell um, from uh, different aspects of the investment supply chain. Um, we've got legal and general investment managers, the principles for responsible investment, Asiona as an issuer of, of, um, of capital market instruments and SRI Connect. So we're delighted uh, to have such an illustrious uh, panel and we'll, get, we'll hear more from them uh, shortly. Next slide, please. Now, as you've already seen when we logged on, this session is being recorded and all participants are muted centrally. The slides and the recording will be made available in the following two days, um, so you will be able to access them uh, coming uh, shortly. If you do wish to however, interact with me, my colleagues or with our panellists, please feel free to do so. And you can use the chat function to do that, or you can also use um, the uh, other options that you see here, such as raise your hand, etc. And we will unmute you in that occasion to allow you to ask your question verbally. Next slide, please. And of course, this is a WBCSD meeting that is for our members and for others. So we've widened participation beyond our membership. But because businesses will be on this call today and there will be interaction, we strongly encourage that this statement become something that you live, with, live by. Antitrust statement for us clearly shows that you must avoid at all costs discussion of in any of the conversations that could be considered to be competitive, sensitive, and topics such as pricing, costs, bid strategies, future capacities, customer and output decisions must be avoided, please. Next slide, please. And so today's agenda, um, we will I will focus initially on giving you an introduction to the WBC WBCSD and the Redefining Value Programme. Um, for our members, I apologise we're doing this again, but given that this webinar is open to uh, a lot more people, we wanted to give at least some background and context to today's topic. I will then hand over to Joss, who will take us through um, the impact that COVID-19 is having on our members in terms of what's happening with their share prices and interactions with the capital markets. And then the main event for today will be our panel discussion, which will be looking at finance and investment dynamics particularly in the current climate and the impacts that COVID-19 presents, both in terms of challenges and potentially opportunities. And of course, we will have a Q&A as well. So the next slide, please. So for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, WBCSD is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. And um, we believe uh, that over the last 25 years, significant progress has been made as uh, to make businesses and policy makers and many other actors in the space aware of the need to transition to low carbon, um, to low carbon solutions to uh, address inequalities 
and to uh, address the biodiversity loss that we see. The WBCSD provides leadership for a sustainable future and we do that through our large network of, of members and global network partners. We currently have 200 global, net, uh, sorry, global companies united around the common theme of creating a world in which nine plus billion people are all living well within the planetary boundaries by 2050. Next slide, please. Our membership, as I said, is 200. And here you see the current list of those, those member companies. Many of them will be familiar to you with their very large household names. But together with our members, we strive to achieve that mission of having a world in where nine plus billion people are living well within the planetary boundaries. And it's through the membership that we are able to uh, drive um, many of our solutions that we co-create with our member companies. In the next slide, you'll see that we are organized around transformation in six main economic systems. We have significant work underway in what we call the circular economy, which is where our work relating to circularity of, of business processes and product innovation, as well as the um, addressing the challenges uh, associated with plastic waste are dealt with. Our work on cities and mobility seeks to look at how we will move people uh, who live in urban environments going forward from, from location A to location B, how those cities will be planned, taking into account the principles of sustainable development, how do we ensure that the building materials are the most sustainable and that the uh, way in which the city is organised is, is socially acceptable. Our work on climate and energy speaks for itself. Here we're working with our member companies to look at the challenges address, uh, that needs to be addressed when we deal with the climate emergency. Here we've got work focusing on helping businesses transition to a low carbon economy, but also looking at how we can uh, influence policy uh, as that is needed for businesses to accelerate that transition. If, we if our ambition is to um, have nine plus billion people living well within the boundaries of the planet, then we need to address how we're going to feed nine plus billion people with nutritious food and ensure that as the population increases that the food supply chain and its interaction with the natural world is understood and, and it's then the negative impacts minimised. So our work on food and nature looks at how can we um, transition to more nutritious, nutritious food, how can we ensure that the the production of that food is as efficient as possible and how can we ensure that um, you know the, the food that we currently have today is getting to the people that need it. Our work on people uh, looks at how we are meeting the basic needs that people need as part of the minimum social foundation that all citizens on planet earth should expect. Here we're looking also at how the future of work will be impacted by technology we're looking at the role of business in, the, uh, in, in uh, addressing human rights challenges and inequalities. And we also, in this program, look at how businesses can and, and are implementing the Sustainable to Development Agenda as put forward by the Sustainable Development Goals. And finally, uh, the program that I lead at WBCSD is called Redefining Value. And here the program looks at helping businesses identify and manage and ultimately disclose material ESG issues so that investors can make it, uh, it better informed decisions based on having data that they can factor into analysis. The program also looks at helping investors understand um, what sustainability means for many, for, from the business side of the equation. And today is where we'll see some of that work um, being demonstrated. We go to the next slide, please. So you've heard a little bit about the WBCSD, you've heard about the six programme areas. Um, if this is the first time you've interacted with one of our virtual event series, then this is where you'll be able to find the uh, information about all of the other uh, programmes that we're offering. There are two sessions per week, two on Monday and two on Wednesday, and they've been running since, since mid-April and will go through to July. Um, this week and next week, the sessions will be around the theme of redefining value. 
um, but there will be very diverse topics being discussed over the, the three months that the virtual event series is operating. What we're trying to do in lieu of our face-to-face -face meetings is provide um, expertise, innovation and an exchange of ideas and opportunities for our member companies and others to remember that even during this crisis, the solutions that we need for a sustainable world are even more important than, than ever before. The current crisis has magnified the importance of the S in the ESG acronym, the social consequences of, of our, our human activity can have devastating effects, not only on human lives, on families, but also on countries and on the economy. But we also should remember that the current crisis has its origins in the natural world. And many of the viruses that have started to impact humanity have resulted from our disrespect, or our lack of understanding, or in some cases, our greed, on trying to um, merge human activity with that of the natural world. Even going far back as HIV, Ebola, SARS, COVID-19, they all have their origins in the transmission of disease from the animal kingdom to the human kingdom. And it shows to me that environmental, social and governance issues are indeed interrelated, interdependent and should be seen in a holistic way. And so these event series come at a very opportune moment, as many people believe that what we're experiencing today with this unprecedented crisis, the impact it's had on the capital markets, is a taster of what is to come when the real issues of climate change and other sustainable development issues um, start to become more granular in the way in which they present themselves. Next slide, please. So to try and make it a little bit more interactive, I hope you have your computer or your, your tablet or whatever device you're using close to hand. And I would uh, ask you if you could go to menti.com on your computer, your phone, your device, and input the code 670999. Because we'd love to know who we're talking to. Um, and I know our panelists are very keen to see the types of people that are in the room because that will help them uh, frame and, and uh, pitch the, uh, the responses uh, to questions that we will have. So hopefully you've managed to do that and if so we can get started. So, who, so the, the magic person that's making all of this work, please let me know what's happening. Press buttons. Or what best describes your job function? So the majority, well, like 60, 65% of people are from the um, business sustainability world. We have one banker, well, you're very welcome, how are you? Um, and we have 10 people who fall into a category that we didn't predict. So um, for our own purposes, it would be lovely if um, those of you that are others could maybe type into the um, chat function a little bit about your job function and we would get an idea of who's there. So thank you very much for that. So you're all welcome, the sustainability people, the others, and of course, our random banker. Very, very brave of you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Right, next slide. So I've talked to you a little bit about the W, I've talked to you about the WBCSD, and I've mentioned that I look after this program called Redefining Value. Um, well, today's uh, virtual event series and today's topic on the capital markets it complements work that we've been doing in redefining value. And in the next slide, we get an overview of what we've been trying to do over the last seven years with this, with this uh, program. This program really sets in, in a, quite a bold context that, that um, when we first started talking about this, many people um, were curious as to what we were trying to, to, trying to do. But basically what we're saying is that today, the financial system, which we don't believe is broken, by the way, the financial system does what it was designed to do, 
it moves money from A to B. Nowhere in there does it say equitable, but it moves money from A to B. It is a logistic system through which funds are allocated um, between different actors in the system. We've seen the growth, however, in what is sometimes called the non-financial system. Uh, our French-speaking friends call it the extra financial system, but anybody that's dealing with COVID-19 will see that it actually is part of the financial system and that um, some real impacts and dependencies on nature and society can mean that what has previously been considered a disconnect is in fact a connection. But when we started this journey in 2014, our simple uh, observation was that those people working on what we call sustainable development or sustainability or corporate social responsibility are disconnected from the financial system. And those working in the financial system are focusing on activities and, and ideas that are not necessarily connected with what the sustainable development system is doing. So there was a disconnect. The information flows that needed to inform decisions in the financial system were not being received. And likewise, the signals coming from the financial system of where it believed risks were going was not being received by the non-financial system, extra financial system, or whatever we're going to end up calling it. So WBCSD sets itself its redefining value program in this area of the disconnect. And then the next slide, we'll be able to show you how we have addressed that. So our mission is to help more well-run companies make better decisions. Um, and we work with business to improve their internal decision making. Many companies got involved in sustainability through external reporting without necessarily having it embedded into the way in which the business makes decisions. And as a result, that disconnect became ever so more real as companies disclosed information that perhaps they weren't using to run the business, that weren't material for the business. And so our work was to say, let's take that back a step further. Let's look at how do we get ESG considerations into the decisions that a company makes around internal resource allocation, around product development, around um, uh, redistribution of, of ideas, innovation processes. And how do we then bring that such that it can improve external disclosure so that the capital markets can put a more honest value on the valuation of a corporation? And how can the capital markets with this informed information then make different choices when it comes to the decision to invest or to uh, offload stock? So for us, redefining value is around information flows, it's around investor grade information, and it's around information that, that, that yields decisions that perhaps have previously been ignored particularly when it comes to impacts and dependencies on what is always considered externalities. But if we're learning anything from COVID-19, these externalities are very much interrelated in what the business is actually doing. Next slide, please. So over the last five, six years, we've developed a number of, of, of uh, projects in sub-programme areas that have attempted to bridge the information uh, gap. And address the disconnect that I previously presented and our work on risk management, governance, internal control, accessing and, man and managing performance um, have all been around what many businesses would do on the day-to-day -day basis within their organisation to understand their impacts and dependencies. This is very much an inside business type activity and we believe when we started this it was an activity that very few companies were really doing. This required the finance function, the strategy function, the treasury function, the accounting department, the auditor, etc., all to be involved in work that previously was seen as somebody else's. But if we wanted to have this integrated into decision making, those functions need to be involved. And our work on external disclosure focused uh, on building on the work we had previously done on reporting matters, but also looking at developing an understanding of the reporting landscape to provide solutions on how businesses should seek to provide purpose-driven disclosure and not just boilerplate disclosures that um, run the risk of being um, all things to all people and therefore nothing to anyone. We have done some work with the IAASB on assurance, on, on assurance and also have uh, issued quite a bit of information 
and reports and guidance on how to improve the accuracy and quality of data, as well as working with our colleagues at the TCFD uh, uh, Secretariat to help companies implement um, the recommendations. And our, our work on uh, investor uh, decision making, uh, focusing on aligning retirement assets is coming to fruition. Um, that has helped many of our member companies have more meaningful conversations around the way in which their retirement assets are invested. Next slide, please. So the purpose-driven disclosure work, I think we're only going to highlight two of these activities today because they're relevant for the conversation that we'll be having with our, our, our panelists. Um, to, we're in reporting season at the moment. Many companies will either have already disclosed their sustainability report or are in the process of finalizing it. Um, and our work on this space is around saying, have you actually thought about why you're doing this? Why are you doing a report? For whom are you doing a report? What do you need to put in that report? What does the user of that report actually need? Where is that report best to be placed, et cetera? And so we've developed an ESG disclosure handbook that allows a structured evaluation of the process that we believe companies should navigate in negotiating their reporting decisions. We want to see at the WBCSD reporting to become more effective and by effective reporting, we mean understanding that the writer of the report, the author of the report, knows what the user needs. And today, we, we, we are focusing on the investor. So what do investors want? And that's a loaded question, and maybe we'll find out later. But we do need to know before we disclose what it is we're disclosing so that it will appeal to the audience that we intend to influence their behavior. And so, this suite of, of reports that you see along the bottom does show that we believe today that reporting needs to be a little bit more structured. And the six questions posed in the disclosure handbook, we believe companies should be utilizing in determining the best way to communicate and disclose information, particularly when it comes to an investor audience. We've also developed the library of indicators because there is an awful lot of stuff out there. And a lot of that stuff is complementary and duplicative. Um, but there are a number of authoritative sources, whether it's the GRI, SASB, uh, Wiki, et cetera. Um, and so we developed on the reporting exchange a library of indicators that allows us to see where the, the, the commonalities are. Because if we want to invest, if we want to invest time in reporting, we therefore want to invest time in producing something that is impactful. And to have something that's impactful, it needs to draw on authoritative sources. And that impact needs to be measured by how it's changing the behavior of all of the actors in that reporting uh, process. That includes the, the writers of the report as well as the users. And we are going to be doing some work on building bridges, which is how do we then support the work that's already been done in more effective dialogues between the repairers and the users. So that's to come. The next slide, please. So, as we said already, we are in the point of uh, moving into the next phase of our work. Um, and this is where our, my, my colleague Joss is very much in the lead. So, we are in the process at the minute of looking at, a user, at, at, at user engagement. I, and for us, the user is, uh, is predominantly the investor. Multi-stakeholder audiences are extremely important. But when it comes to investors, we believe that they need um, to perhaps set special attention and particularly in the way and the, the timing and the um, disclosure practices that will attract um, an investor participation. So coming soon we are developing work to unlock this um, effective engagement and communication between investors and issuers and bringing new actors to that conversation for sustainability purposes. So we're working with our CFO network for example to see how we can bring investor relations and the CFO into that debate. The Building Bridges project, um, which will complete in 2021, um, is designed to really target um, the issues that we identify here. And we're working to develop uh, really important partnerships with organizations like PRI, for example, um, where we have complementary activities. 
And of course, what we're happen, what's happening in the last few weeks and the response that needs to happen with COVID-19 has also shown that we need to act quicker. Um, the capital markets have suffered significantly as a result of the pandemic. Um, and how do we recover from that? Do we want to recover and go back to the way we were? Or is there something different that needs to happen? How will the investment community respond to the recovery of, of businesses? Will they want to see evidence of resilience being embedded into the operations of that company? How do we address some of the disclosure practices to give comfort to that audience that what we're doing to recover from the current issue will be something that will stand the test of time? So these are all the things that will be covered um, in the work that we're now doing. So next slide, please. And one final bit that's really just a, an opportunity to give you some more information. We've been working over the last two years with Alliance BlackRock, Legal and General, Mercer, Natixis and PRI to develop um, two toolkits to help businesses understand um, the ESG principles that they could embed into their retirement asset uh, or retirement plans. And they've been working with over 35 companies within the WBCSD to offer ESG linked uh, investments um, as part of the uh, pension offerings that the companies offer. So I would refer you to these two resor uh, resources if you wish to find out a bit more. But I think that's enough for me and I'm going to hand over to Joss um, who will take us through some um, initial findings from our uh, work during COVID-19 and um, leave you in his capable hands. Very much, Rodney. I think we have a, a, a mention of uh, Paul next. Uh, and uh, if, uh, for those of you that didn't take part in the previous poll, to access this poll, you need to go to www.menti.com and put in the following code 670999. And we'd just like to get a question or get a feel for your answers on, on what types of resources you're looking for from WBCSD to assist in supporting effective corporate investor dialogue. So if you've all managed to access that, it should be getting some results at some point. I can't see anything coming through at the moment, Josh. No? Well, uh, I think let's give it one. Oh, here we go. So we're getting some more information. As Rodney said, we are currently undertaking a project to try and understand some of the dynamics that might be emerging. And what, what are the types of behaviours and expectations on each side? So we have a range of things here, simple communication, support, best practice guidance, standards, sector information on COVID-19 impact. That's uh, a fantastic sort of set of things coming through and hopefully we'll have a chance to explore in the discussion coming up in a, in a few minutes with our experts as to how they see some of these perspectives. Excellent. Um, obviously some of these some of these topics we uh, already have some activity and some sources of information and solutions and we're also keen to build upon these. So I think in the interest of timing and making sure we have enough time for a good panel discussion, 
Uh, I think we'll move on. So Ellie, you all right to um, take us to the next slide? Fantastic, thank you so much. So as Rodney mentioned, uh, this section of the um, insert is going to be a little bit, giving you a bit of an insight into the sorts of research. We've, we've undertaken some uh, high level research to look at what sort of trends we might be able to perceive in terms of companies which you might expect to have a more progressive uh, and more developed approach to uh, the management of environmental, social and governance issues and to see what uh, the relative impact is or relative performance is of those companies uh, have been during the COVID crisis. And we particularly obviously focused upon our members. Could you move us on a slide, please, Ellie? Can we have the next slide, please? So I think the first thing to say is that this uh, is the first stab. It's what we think is might be indicative data. It's not normalized in the sense that this is WBCSB members across the regions of the world um, against stock market performance. So it's not necessarily always comparing like with like. And we also would like to make sure that we're aware of the context which is that um, we're not entirely sure how normal this beha the behavior of the stock market is in general. There's been some research published recently uh, looking, uh, saying that stock market um, effects are largely driven by government decisions at the moment. And we're also aware that COVID is impacting different parts of the world in different ways. However, we believe that the um, data that we've identified is relatively consistent across the world. Um, so as you can see from this slide, there is a outperformance that we're noting between our members in different regions and the market in general. So this slide is showing the North American region and a 9.4% outperformance. Ellie, is it okay if we have the next slide? So this is showing data for our European members. And again, we have a small outperformance across the last couple of months. I'm being told that there's a disturbance in sound quality. Can I go to a different mode of operation? Rodney, can I ask you just to pick up the next couple of slides while I swap headphones? Sure. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So uh, as, as Joss has been saying, um, as obviously as a membership based organization, we want to ensure that our members are being, um, are, are, are we, we're checking what's happening with their stock price. But as you can see, and as I mentioned earlier, the S in the ESG um, conversation has resulted in, in, in what could only be described as value destruction. Um, and what we see here, uh, and I know there could be a lot of criticisms around the, the crudeness with which we've done this, but what we're seeing when we look at uh, a, a portfolio made up of WBCSD members in Europe versus um, all members across all of those um, stock exchanges that they are listed on, is that the, uh, it, there is an, an outperformance. Now, of course, what we see here is a uh, you know, potentially a correlation but not necessarily a causation that this is due to sustainability. But it's interesting nonetheless to know that two things from here, that the COVID-19 crisis has resulted in destruction of value, and that's value destruction for those companies, for those investors. But you and me, our pension schemes are likely to be invested in any of this. Our investments are likely to be invested in um, many of these organizations. And therefore, we are, as individuals, worse off as to is the overall uh, size of the market. That said, the WBCSD members are outperforming that market by what you see here, a margin of around 4.3%. Joss, are you back? Okay. 
I, can you hear me all right, Rodney? And is the sound yeah, much better? better? Yes. Apologies to everyone for mucking their ears around. It's the last thing you want. Um, so thank you so much. Um, if it's okay to go to the next slide. So again, picking up from what Rodney was saying, and again, making sure that we're, we're not trying to um, obfuscate too much, there is a consistent thread which our findings are showing across the uh, Asian market as well, where there is a uh, discernible outperformance for those members that, uh, uh, um, that we have in these, these regions and the wider stock market or a correlation between performance and the wider stock market. As you can see in India, there are some areas where there's been a divergence and an underperformance, but a latter uh, recovery and outperformance. If we could go to the next slide, please. So stepping back from the data and, and the indicative data we are seeing that markets are perceiving those companies more, with more progressive more embedded and more strategic approaches to ESG management or the, the management of sustainability issues as being indicative of good management um, and uh, we also see that there are indications that investors are seeing that companies that undertake better and more strategic sustainability management as giving rise to a greater resilience. And this picks up from evidence that has been produced over the last couple of decades, which is that those companies with better approaches to this management of ESG issues um, tend to have lower share price volatility over time. Could we have the next slide, please? If we interpret this in another way, uh, we are seeing that those companies with a more progressive and more strategic approach to the management of sustainability issues are receiving or able to access capital at a lower cost. And if you can see that the last uh, column in each of these colored graphs you can see that those companies with better or higher ESG performance are those which tend to be able to access capital at a lower cost, um, have a better cost of uh, uh, um, a lower cost of equity, and a lower cost of debt. So we are seeing a relationship between sustainability performance and financial performance whether it be the resilience or outperformance of shares or the uh, price of capital or and of financing. Next slide, please. Another element that we've tried to uh, look at is the extent to which or, or how behavior in terms of the engagement between companies and, is, and, and investors is changing. And obviously, when you're not allowed to travel, type, uh, communication, as we all know, we're all on Zoom nowadays, there's been uh, a change in how companies are engaging with their investors in terms of AGMs. And uh, uh, as, as this slide is indicating, we're finding that there's more movement between uh, there there's some postponement that's going on. There's a growth in virtual meetings. So where companies and investors are, are having AGMs, but doing that with, uh, with, with investors virtually. And there's also indications that companies are considering hybrid meetings. And I know in the panel discussion that uh, some of our colleagues uh, will have some insights into whether this forms part of a perhaps a wider trend towards virtual engagements between issuers and companies and to what extent it's a, a reaction to the current crisis. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? So we've uh, surveyed, surveyed our investors in terms of uh, our members in terms of their approaches 
And we've seen that 37% of companies have decided to hold the meeting in this virtual format. 13% of European and, and no North American members are selecting the hybrid meeting. And uh, a larger proportion are taking a wait and see approach. But obviously, as we know, COVID is affecting different parts of the world in different ways. Some parts of the world are earlier in the curve of COVID impacting upon the population and some are coming later. And so the wait and see approach makes a lot of sense and uh, we are consistently responding to levels of uncertainty that perhaps we're quite unused to in terms of business as usual. And uh, so one of the things we'd like to emphasize is we're, we're not trying to say that these are definitive trends or that the trends will continue because we have high levels of uncertainty. We certainly think that some of these aspects, some of these behaviors are uh, interesting and some of them may form the basis of longer term trends uh, irrespective of COVID. Could we have the next slide, please? So we'd like to do another Mentimeter poll and uh, just to ask you, based upon the last set of information that I delivered, how have your plans to communicate on sustainability to investors changed as a result of COVID-19? As before, if you could go to www.menti.com and put in the code 670999. So in terms of uh, ha have you, are you communicating on a similar level? Are you doing it less direct? Are you having more direct, more virtual? Has sustainability become less important to communicate? Or are you putting more and more effort into sustainability communication? Fantastic. If for those of you that haven't had a chance to log in, please do so. We'd love to get your answers on this. We'll just do, I think, uh, another minute or another half minute or so to see if we get any more votes. But I think at the moment there's quite an uh, interesting trend emerging that uh, we have a significant number of people who are maintaining a similar or um, level overall of communication on sustainability to investors. But I think there's also uh, uh, an interesting element in terms of uh, ramping up so maintaining the increase of communication of sustainability to investors. With a small, very small number of uh, no time for sustainability. I think what we've seen in previous crises, mostly financial ones, is that sometimes sustainability can fall off the agenda. What we are also seeing now is that perhaps we have passed a bit of a, um, a threshold in that sustainability is much more embedded within corporate um, activity and much more part of the agenda of, for engagement and communication with investors. So it is showing more resilience that sustainability is part of business as usual. Okay, if we could do one more refresh, Ellie, and then we'll move on. There's no changes to the data that's currently there, Josh. Okay, thank you very much, Ellie. Okay, so thank you very much for that input. And uh, I think we're gonna move into the um, panel discussion to pick up some of the themes and the threads and the findings that we've had so far. So if we could move on. Okay, thanks, Ellie. Can we have the next slide? So in terms of giving uh, a good opportunity to explore the different dimensions of the engagements between issuers and investors, between companies and investors, we, uh, we'd like, we, we've sought to get representatives from across the investment chain. Now this graphic is just showing the different parties, the different players within the wider investment chain. 
from uh, those people that provide research, those people that interpret the research in terms of credit impacts, those people that provide the capital, those people that support and advise on the management of uh, assets and asset allocation, and those people that own it. Now, in terms of the panel that we have today, we have representatives who are able to speak for and about credit rating agencies and the um, uh, credit allocation. We have issuer uh, voice, a, an investment voice and an asset management voice. Uh, if you could move on to the next slide, please, Ellen. So in terms of introducing our panel, I'm just going to mention who they are and then go from one to each other for them to give a, a very brief in introduction to their role. So we have Alexander Burr, who is a global ESG public policy analyst at Elgin, which is legal and general investment management. We have Carmen Nutso, Nutso uh, head of fixed income at the Principles for Responsible Investment, PRI. Jose Lu Luis Blasco, who's Global Director of Sustainability at Acciona, who is representing a, a corporate voice. And last but not least, we have Mike Tyrrell, who is editor at SRI Connect, uh, who's been a, an investor and a professional on many sides of the investment chain and has a perspective of how to connect businesses and investors. So I'm going to hand over to each of you briefly just to say a quick hello and a very quick overview of your roles. Firstly, Alex, can I hand over to you? Hi, Joss. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, Alexander Byrne, as Joss said, I'm, I'm in policy for Elgin. Um, I joined Elgin uh, towards the end of last year into the newly called Investment Stewardship Team, which used to be our corporate governance team. Um, the change happened quite recently as I think it's sort of uh, a good reflection of the way we're approaching these topics um, as we're, we're trying to have a more uh, global view and we're trying to have a, a you know a, a broader view in terms of what we engage on along the ESG uh, uh, sort of uh, sectors. Um, yeah, that's me. Thank you, Alex. If I could ask uh, Carmen, if you're happy to uh, say a quick hello and uh, give an idea about your role and your focus. Yes, sure. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rod and Joss, uh, for inviting me today. Um, I'm leading the fixed income team at the, the Principles for Responsible Investment within the Investment Practices team. Uh, I've been working at the PRI since April 2017. Uh, we um, cover a wide range of asset classes within fixed income, uh, focusing on corporate bonds, sovereign bonds, and recently we've launched two new work streams on sub-sovereign bonds and structured products. But most of my time at the PRI over the last few years has been focusing on nurturing a dialogue between credit analysts on the investor side and credit rating agencies. So I'm happy to elaborate more on uh, the results we have achieved so far later during the webinar and also on what we're hearing at the moment from both sides. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Jose Luis, are you happy to give us an introduction to yourself? Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm coming from Fiona. I am the Global Head of Sustainability. Our company is a very special company. We, we, we cover uh, energy and infrastructure sector. We uh, emit last year, 4 billion in ESG paper um, um, around the, the, the world. Uh, we have a very interesting exercise that I invite you to, to have a look because we are the first company applying the EU taxonomy. You can uh, identify what kind of uh, um, activities we are performing aligned with the EU taxonomy is uh, public and audited by our financial auditor. Um, I am a member of the TEC, or the Technical Expert Group of the European Commission on Sustainable Finance. Uh, and the last thing that could be interesting for the, our audience could be that uh, um, we believe that the current uh, situation is an opportunity for sustainable investment. And, and we are very interested to uh, show how the investors are 
uh, trust in, in this new wave uh, as a new opportunity of, uh, for investors and for issuers. Thank you so much, Jose Luis. And um, Mike, can I ask you to give a little bit of an introduction on yourself, please? Yeah, sure, Joss. Um, I'm Mike Tyrrell. I love the way you introduced me as an investment and a professional, as if the two are separate things. Can I be an investor or indeed professional about what you do? Um, I've worked in sustainable investment for 20 years in asset management and investment banking and research. Um, I now work for SRI Connect, which, as you say, is a platform that helps companies communicate on sustainability more effectively to investors. Uh, why I think I'm relevant to your audience today is that I'm conducting a huge study for the European Commission on companies experiences communicating on sustainability and ESG issues with investors so if you have views on those please do let me know them as soon as possible and why I think it might be interesting going forward is that I'm going to be working with you and the team at WBCSD on the Building Bridges project so again if you're a company and you're interested in building bridges with sustainable investors then get in touch with Joss and the team that's me Thanks very much, Mike, and thanks for the encouragement to get involved in building bridges, which we're developing uh, now. So to get into the conversation uh, and to pick up a couple of things, I think um, uh, what we'd like to do in terms of the sort of first topic to explore is to perhaps pick up on some of the um, Mentimeter indications that we're getting about the sort of consistency of ESG communication to investors and some of the participants in that survey talking about continuing to ramp up their engagement and communication with investors. So I'd like to gain the panel's perspectives on what are the challenges and emerging issues on maintaining this ESG focus uh, in the current crisis. Um, and do I have any volunteers or shall I pick some? I'm going to go for Alex, is it all right if I ask you that question to sort of pick that up? What are the sort of challenges that are going on at the moment in maintaining the focus on ESG in this current crisis? Sure, thanks, Joss. Um, so in the immediate and well, short term, our focus has been on um, really supporting companies doing what they, they need to do to shore up their, their balance sheet and support the response to, to COVID. Um, I think... Um, maintaining this sort of focus on ESG at the moment is critically important. Um, I think it's it's really sort of demonstrates uh, whether they're you know how engaged they are on their human capital management side, um, how they're valuing uh, and supporting their employees. Um, I think there's a there's sort of an issue here around. Um, what are, they, what are they doing to um, whether they will be paying their dividends or not, whether they, whether they can or not. Um, I think there's, there's some things going on around um, um, whether there's uh, appropriate levels of tax transparency historically as well. Uh, I think that's been challenging in the past. Um, I think it's one which we'll sort of focus on uh, going forward as well. Um, one, I guess, challenge which has also been highlighted a bit as well is um, an overboarding issue, something which we've been talking about for a while. So um, a number of board, board members or NEDs will, will sit on, you know, up to seven sort of boards. Now, when it comes to a sort of crisis, uh, obviously, you know, there's a, there's a, creates a real issue in there and how the, the support of which they can provide to the company. So. This, level, this sort of governance indicator still remains crucially important. You know, does the director have enough sufficient time to support the company and their response and how they, how they deal with it in a crisis such as this? So that's been quite an interesting one and one which we will sort of continue to engage on going forward. Um, that and I guess it's less relevant in the UK, but in the US, the chair and CEO split has been a, has been an important one for us. Um, you know that we need that level of independence between the two, um, as it's often a combined role in the US. Um, so it's having that level of you know that check um, in a in a crisis response period is also very important. Um, Fantastic, thanks, Alex. So 
Um, I, I think one of the things that, that we were sort of hinting at in terms of the, some of the data earlier is the extent to which those companies that take a more progressive approach to ESG and the management of sustainability uh, tend to get understood as being you know, more or better managed and the role of governance within that context is, is essential. Um, can I turn to, um, on the topic of sort of maintaining ESG and the, the, the importance of having good governance or, or crises highlighting the challenges. Mike, Mike, uh, you turned off your mic. Uh, do you have a, a point you'd like to make on this? And then we'll turn to the other colleagues. Yeah, so I think that I think how companies can communicate on sustainability at this point sort of breaks down into two questions. You've got the how you do it um, and the what you should be communicating on. But as Alexander started with the what, I think I'll endorse that to a degree and say I think the, the what companies need to be communicating about um, is twofold. There are the, there are the obvious COVID-19 related issues. So health, how do you manage health and safety at a time of COVID-19? The one which I hadn't thought of, but Alexander thinks is a great point about is your board able to, to, to function in a, at a time of crisis? So there are the sort of specific issues which will come to the fore. But then I think um, you can expect companies not only to focus on these social issues, but also investors will be starting to look at the economic dimension of companies' performance. So I think we've traditionally talked about ES as if there was a sort of, or ENS issues, but, it's, but companies have environmental impacts, social impacts, and economic impacts. And those economic impacts are structurally different from their financial impacts. So governments will be allowing companies to come back to work and encouraging them to come back to work if they support the economy regardless of what they do for their shareholders. So being able to demonstrate that your business supports economic development, I think is gonna be critically important. But a little bit, COVID-19 exposes, just like the financial crisis did before, the flaw in the ESG taxonomy. You have to have this economic dimension as well. Um, I think the other thing that companies will see is that COVID-19 has shown us, as Rodney recognized, um, the structural nature of sustainability risks and opportunities. So I think we can expect, I think companies can expect investors to be asking much more fundamental questions about how businesses are positioned for, the, for when structural changes happen. It happens that the first way this has been exemplified has been through a pandemic, but again, as Rodney highlighted, um, climate change is around the corner, uh, economic inequalities could be another one. There are plenty of other sort of potentially structural changes going on here. So I think we can, companies can expect to see investors pushing on the obvious issues, on the economic dimension, and then on the structural issues. Of course, the other thing is that investors will be looking for resilience. So in the same point as the, the title of this presentation, but also as, as I think Alexander highlighted, there's a degree to which investors will say, okay, this has happened once, but it better never happen again. We need to see that your business is resilient to this, to either a second phase of COVID-19 or for a second, uh, a phase of something different. So those are the what's, the how's we can, we can do later, but those are my, my thoughts on the what's. Fantastic, thanks Mike. Um, I'd like to, oh, sorry, Jose Luis, yes. Um, um, let me, let me just to be uh, a little bit provocative in this webinar, okay? <laughs> Uh, I, th I think that sometimes, sometimes I think that the, the problem is not in the corporate side, the problem is this financial sector side. I think that the, 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 the people who has not clue about what is happening is more in the, in the financial sector side than in the corporate side. Why? Because most of the th approaches that they are using are, you, are um, uh, close to the risk assessments. And they say, oh my God, they are not evidence that, that climate change is affecting your PNL. It's not affecting your 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 budget next week, next year. And this is not a question to include in that. And with this approach, the risk approach during the last 10 years, what we get? We get a uh, less volatile indexes in the ESG. And this is the result. The result of the risk approach is to have less volatile and more resilient indexes. But this is not the question. This is not the, the, the goal. The goal is to have an impact. 
And I wonder sometimes, do you think that, for example, in the risk, in the risk approach, this is a question for all my colleagues also, with the risk approach, we, have make, we are making any impact, any additionality, or we are only reflecting what the companies are doing in the, common, in, in the current society. And sometimes I wonder how the, the real, uh, because I can give you an example makes sense that we have sustainable indexes with oil and gas companies inside. Makes sense that we have uh, uh, ESG uh, uh, indexes with airlines, for example. The, the, the one thing is that when we are talking about the transition and the risk, and these companies are making a lot of effort to improve, another thing is what we want to do in, the, in, this, in, in, the, in 2050. With this, this approach, I want to, 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 to ask my colleague if, if many of these ESG investment resist the, I call it the Greta Acid Test. Uh, the Greta Acid Test, we say, okay, do you think that the current approach of the ESG is, is, is real or is only a um, question of time? My provocative question is, where is the problem? The problem is that in the corporate side, or is in the financial sector who is not understanding well what is happening outside? Sorry. Fantastic, Jose Luis, and I'm sure there'll be lots of. I just want to make sure that uh, um, I get Carmen. Is it okay to bring your perspective in on this? Because I think, I think you know your your work sort of straddles quite a lot of the challenges that that Jose Luis was uh, talking about. Uh, and uh, is it okay to sort of get your perspective in terms of the both the rating side and the and the fixed income side of, of, of your perspective? Yeah, yeah, sure. This is actually very exciting and uh, and interesting. I think it's not a question of blaming which one side or another for not grasping this. And 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 I think we really should stop demystifying this idea that ESG is a nice add-on to have. ESG or sustainability considerations, whatever you want to call them, have to be truly embedded in the strategic planning of a company. And um, I agree with you, Jose Luis, when you say uh, the um, only the, the pure risk assessment might be um, restrictive in terms of the analysis. We need to go beyond that. We also need to measure what you call impact at the PRI, we call it outcome. And outcome is not necessarily only positive outcome, a positive contribution to environmental and society goals, but also a reduction of the negative outcome. So it's, it's a game that we have to contribute to all together. With the work that I've been doing um, specifically on how to embed ESG factors in credit risk analysis, what has become very clear is that there is a huge confusion in the market between what it means considering ESG factors purely from the credit risk perspective and their financial materiality, as opposed to profiling companies based on, if you will, their ESG credentials. They're not two disjointed aspects of the analysis, they're complementary and investors actually should look at both before making any investment decision. Uh, but at the moment, the focus is obviously on credit because companies are fighting for survival. They have, before the policymakers intervened, faced a huge liquidity crunch. Um, and uh, the question was obviously, as ESG who have a sustainability criteria being put on the back burner. But that was the wrong question to ask, I think. It's the, the communication is more important than ever at this juncture, particularly from fixed income investors, not just equity investors, because they fund projects, they can fund the recovery and they can help to shape the recovery. So yes, I agree with Mike, there are some short-term issues versus long-term issues, but this is a very important point, I think, to reset the whole system and if we ask the right questions and we've maintained the communication open we can the investors can really help the companies to um, address sustainability issues in a different optic but at the same time companies can explain their difficulties to investors and um, how they're going to approach them so we're very much in need of communications around targets around sustainability and strategic planning. And if companies cannot meet the targets, that's okay. But what are they doing to meet those targets? Are they coming up with a new plan or are they delaying them? 
but as long as that communication is open, I think we can make progress as an industry. I'll stop here to see. Thanks, Carmen. Um, I just, just to, um, uh, before handing over, there's a couple of questions that, that I, I think Jose Luis has framed the challenge beautifully. And also, I think, perhaps being provocative in the sense of, of keeping our eye on the, on the main challenge that we have. Now, I think we want to make sure that we don't minimise the fact that we're, we're currently in a, a global crisis and a global crisis that, as Rodney was saying, is, is potentially, we don't know, but has potentially arisen from how we've understood complex systems or how we've ignored those things or how, how our focus upon certain types of activity has given rise to damage and then risks from the natural world. But we're also facing a larger challenge that is related to climate change, that's related to nature loss, that's related to water challenges, um, to some really big picture issues that are, are going to present significant challenges to the way that we organise ourselves. So Jose Luis, from my perspective, raised a few questions at, at, at a timescale challenge a mismatch between the types of um, time horizons that many investors are using and the types of time horizons that the environmental and social challenges that we're seeing impact upon and the extent to which that mismatch is giving rise to an inability to value sustainability and the transitions that corporates uh, are required and capital needs to change in order to support he talked about the fact that a risk-driven approach hasn't really helped us to avoid the challenges that we're seeing at the moment and questioning the sort of if we can use a risk management approach then we've got everything sorted. He also talked about scale challenges to what extent are we really supporting and driving transition towards the, the, the types of change required for a sustainable future. And he also mentioned this idea of, you know, is best in class going to get us there is that approach. Um, I just wanted to pick up uh, a couple of things. I know, uh, Alex, in terms of uh, LGIM's approach, uh, you have had a sort of strategic focus upon infrastructure investment and, and, and therefore a very much a long term approach. Do you have any perspectives from the LGIM side on, on, on sort of how you're dealing with this timescale issue of immediate crisis versus long-term change? Um, thank, thank you. Um, maybe controversially, I, I, I very much agree. We aren't fast enough. We haven't been reacting quickly enough. Capital hasn't been going towards, um, you know, green sectors quickly enough. Um, you know, that can be seen um, for the calls for the late, latest sort of sixth carbon budget. You know, the policy, the policy direction is not there yet. Um, so I, I tend to agree. And one of my sort of top three priorities is how we, well, two of them is how we're going to achieve this, achieve net zero more quickly in the UK and, and the EU. And how are we going to stimulate capital to, to go into those sectors? Um, so I think... Yes, continue, you know, we've been focusing on long-term infrastructure, absolutely. But what more can we do to stimulate new innovation, new ideas? How can we use maybe our, our sort of balance sheets, use that as some sort of patient capital? Could we work with the government more closely in these areas? That's my personal view of this. Um, as in, I think we, ha we all have been a bit of laggards in this sector um you know part some some could argue partly because um there hasn't been that level of disclosure um necessary well necessary level of disclosure to allocate capital towards the the sort of greener companies and sectors uh you know and that's been worked on and you know the taxonomy is in place now we're 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 you know all working on how we sort of can um you know, bring the sustainability level directives into the UK, etc. Um, so that's happening. But I, I tend to agree, you know, this isn't happening fast enough. Um, TCFD, when, you know, the final recommendations, I think it was 2017, wasn't it? So, and it's 2020. And why isn't TCFD mandatory? Um, why are we still debating that that could be a few years out? I, I find some of that. So on a timescale, I, I, I do agree. Um, and that's certainly something that we're, we're trying to push for. And that's, maybe I should say, 
my responsibility as I've come into to try and do that with the UK and more broadly and globally, you know, push the, the regulators or the, you know, the governments which are, have concerns about bringing this slowly into the market. But, well, you know, why don't, you know, we're in a climate or in a sort of net zero climate emergency. So why don't we react as such? Thanks, Alex. Carmen, would you like to pick up on that, that point and the previous to the topics that we've discussed? Yeah, sure. I, I very much concur with um, Alex in the fact that we are late um, in taking many measures to accelerate the transition towards net zero. Uh, I think, if anything, in addition to what Rod said earlier in the opening remark to the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic has contributed to escalate the materiality of social factors in investment decisions, probably because now people are thinking more about health and safety and, uh, and their potential business um, financial and reputational consequences. What this has highlighted is also the, the really potential destructive nature uh, of, uh, of some of these issues that um, encompass a, a global dimension. And if anything, I think what the COVID-19 fallout, fallout has taught us is how systemic risks can be. What are how big are the repercussions that can be felt across uh, different supply chains that are so interconnected now, that are so globalized. So why hit the wall before uh, thinking of what are the right measures rather than preemptive some of these measures? And there have been some warning signals, admittedly not many, but the, the, the COVID-19 crisis come, hasn't come completely unexpected. In fact, some of the countries that have experienced similar and flu um, uh, conditions in, in uh, over the past years, I've, I'm thinking of the SARS, of the avian flu, etc., have reacted earlier, and and they were in a better position to tackle the pandemic. The policymakers themselves uh, have reacted much faster than they did uh, after the financial crisis of 2008-2009, which was due to different causes, but they were in a much better position to react this time because they had rehearsed already. So what I'm trying to say is that really the preparedness uh, is key here. And, uh, and, and it, although it's too probably early to draw some definitive lessons, I think one of the main ones is really uh, the shift that we have to make from forecasting to scenario analysis. Scenario analysis is very much in fashion now because it's one of the recommendations of the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate-Related uh, Financial Disclosure, but it's not new. And, uh, and scenario analysis really helps companies as well as investors to measure sensitivities to different um, possible outcomes. And most importantly, to focus on what are the triggers that could make... Um, the base case scenario shift into the risk scenario. And one final comment, and then I stop there, tail risk scenarios can become base case scenarios. Just because they come with a low probability doesn't mean that they have to be discarded. And if anything, this is also another important lesson that we can learn from the COVID-19 spread. I stop here. Thanks, Carmen. I think that's a, a, an essential point, which is that, that to some extent, we've had a sort of risk management process, which is looking at predictability but not necessarily upon uh, vulnerability. So, you know, how vulnerable are companies to things, uh, to systemic shocks? How vulnerable are they to changes in resource availability, resource pricing? How vulnerable are they to the sorts of things that they may be unlikely, but, and, and, uh, but, but can stand to, to, to change the dynamics of the system as a whole? Mike, can I hand over to you on, I'm sure you've got perspectives on this challenge that how do we deal with ill-equipped Ill or sort of lack of perspective of the long term? How do we deal with risk? How do we move from risk to scenarios and, and understanding vulnerability? I'm going to disagree with Jose Luis instead. So uh, I, hate panels, I, hate panel, I hate panels that agree. That's, um, so although I, I, I think I'm going to, I think there's a, there's a broad basis on which I agree with what everybody's just said. Um, Jose Luis, yes, it is investors' fault, but get over it. Who's going to fix it? Answer, companies. If you let investors try to define how to understand companies' businesses and the sustainability risks and issues they run, they will come up with insane reporting metrics with thousands of indicators and send you questionnaires ad infinitum 
and the, you know, that's the crazy world we get into if we allow investors to try and define and understand the real world. That's not their job. But also you want their money. So the communications problem is yours. It's the company's, I'm afraid, and it may not be your responsibility or it may not feel fair, but if companies want investors' money, they have to get out there and make that case, communicate the sustainability challenges over the time frames and in the ways that they face them and the opportunities, as you said. And don't let them constantly make this a question about risk. If you perceive there to be an opportunity, you've got to get out there and you've got to tell investors why it's an opportunity and why they should be investing in you. Now, where I think it, so the communications challenge, I think I'm afraid does lie with companies, not only you, but also all of the other companies on the call. The investor's response, however, is their responsibility. And this is where I'm gonna try and needle Alexander a bit, um, because I think investors' responses to COVID-19 fall into, exposes a quite a significant difference between different styles of sustainable investment. Some are doing very well out of it. They're not crowing about it because the world is in considerable pain at the moment, but they have been, they've had no oil stocks, they've had no airline stocks, they're long healthcare, they're long technology and communication stocks. Their performance relatively is doing very nicely, but they're fundamental sustainability investors who've made uh, asset allocation decisions based on trends and themes they see coming through. They didn't see COVID-19 as the cause of this economic disruption, but they were positioned their, their portfolios in a way that has actually played relatively well for them. But then you have the other group, the ESG risk type uh, investors, and they will, because it's what they're supposed to do, track risk and ensure that the world, that the portfolios are governed in whatever direction the world is going. So passive ESG funds will, assure, will ensure that on a world to total transition or on a world to economic and social collapse, their portfolios will never deviate too markedly from the, uh, from the rest of the, the, from other portfolios. So you have two very different responses. And I think COVID-19 presently, but as water shortages or climate change or demographic change will in future exposes two very different responses, uh, it, it, it exposes two very different investment strategies. Uh, thanks, Mike. I'm going to, I'm conscious of time. We have 10 minutes left. What I'd like to do is pick up on the, the two bombs that have Mike's thrown and then ask a sort of final question around the dynamics. Uh, Jose Luis, I think for, first Mike, you know, Mike was pretty clear. It's, it's your problem to make the case <laughs> or to talk to investors about how you create value, what, how you interpret the, the big changes in the world and how you're going to be a company that succeeds over the long term. How, I, I presume you agree, really. Yeah, and I, to, 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 to very, very short. Uh, I, 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 um, believe me, uh, I make uh, around five to ten uh, meetings with investors every every month in the roadshows, and, and and investors love simplicity, not complexity. And I think that uh, we are providing information that they are uh, asking for, but the questions are. For me, in my perspective, is wrong. I can give you an example. The Dow Jones Sustainability Index is working with now with the information that we provide from the fiscal year 2018. This is stupid. He's driving, looking at the at the, at the mirror. At the mirror, it's not is not real. This is stupid. But this is another problem. The the problem is that we have more smart smart investors now uh, who are providing more insight or, or are asking questions about the next step. What is your, what are you with your current equipment, are you in the condition to survive in 2030 with a 50% of reduction of CO2? Is, is credible your, 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 um, um, business, uh, your business model? And the second that I, I, I say a question for you also for, for what happened with the stimulus package? What happened? Because everybody is talking about the green recovery and we are talking about five, five, five trillions of, peer, of money uh, in the mainstream working for make or not the transition. And I think that is a very relevant 
paper uh, role that the financial sector could have in this green recovery. I am not, I don't like the, the, the word resilience because resilience is, is came from the, from the Latin resilio, is it jump back and we need to jump to, uh, forward. This is not the question that we need to jump back. We need to jump forward and we, we need to jump forward. You need to have another way of thinking when we are applying trillions of euros that we will apply into the financial system. Some of the financial entities has a role to play to apply this huge amount of money to make it happen, to make the new, uh, um, a new uh, economic model works. Um, fantastic. And I just wanted, just picking up from that, Jose Luis, and, and hand over to Alex, because I know that LGM have been thinking about putting lots of you know, thought into uh, green recovery. Is that, um, you know, and, and Jose Luis highlighted the challenge that we, you know, we had a you know, massive stimuli from the last financial crash of last decade that seemed to be pointed in the wrong direction and gave rise to more of the same. What, what's the perspective from the investment perspective of building back better? Um, so so I, I agree. I think, you know, there's stimulus packages which has already started, which it doesn't seem to be clear how that is being provided out, particularly in the UK. Um, I think we need to be looking now at a more medium long term stimulus package and and perhaps more controversially than some of my um, colleagues how can we really use that as an opportunity to stimulate um, commitments to net zero? Maybe what are we, you know, what are the conditionals or conditionalities of which we are applying to those, those stimulus packages? Um, where are we allocating that and which sectors are we going to allocate that to? Um, you know, it is perhaps controversially to allocate it to you know, the ones which are supporting that green transition more than traditionally have done. Um, so from an Elgin perspective, we, we absolutely want to see um, the direction the government in the UK and others take um, in that way, which will support that net transition or that net zero transition. Um, how we can go about financing it, look, it, it is for us, we need to we need to understand what the companies have been doing in this area, um, not just on a, on a quantitative basis, but also qualitative. So what some of the others have also been saying, how have you been responding? It's not just, you know, it's not just an indicator. We, we really need the behind and the explanation behind that. Um, but certainly where we can, from my perspective, I'll be pushing the governments um, to be more ambitious and perhaps be more controversial about where we can support or where we should be supporting um which may mean you know some companies naturally um you know won't be progressing or won't won't continue on the same path as they had done up until now just can i jump in very quickly can, um, because I'm, I'm conscious of time i just wanted yes. to make two remarks in response to what jose luis said and also alex said that it, it I, I think Jose Luis was right in highlighting the difference between resilience, but also the need to move forward. But at this juncture, it's very important to be resilient because if company go bust and out of the market, they cannot even jump forward. So we need to distinguish, the, again, the short-term implication versus the long-term ones. And, and you're right, Jose Luis is saying that investors have become smarter and, and perhaps more demanding, but it's really important to keep that conversation going because sometimes investors may not ask the right questions. Uh, companies may feel that they provide data, but they um, are not understood uh, in terms of their strategic planning or investors complain they don't, don't find the right data. So keeping that dialogue is, is of utmost importance to, to make progress again. And, and I, I agree also with Alex um, in terms of, you know, redirecting capital and having a unique opportunity right now to support and accelerate the transition to net zero. Uh, but let's not forget that we have a unique opportunity because of what's happening to oil prices for unrelated reasons. So we've had an oil price uh, crisis that has exacerbated or added to the ongoing COVID crisis. So that's 
perhaps I was struck by how the media um, headlines have changed compared to say the end of March uh, relative to the most recent one. So the end of March, this was like, oh, the drop in oil prices will threaten the uh, acceleration to net zero economy. Now it's the other way around. Some people are actually forecasting a peak of oil demand much earlier than anybody would have thought. So it, it, it's really a, up to both investors and companies to grab this opportunity uh, as disruptive as it may have been, uh, but to make progress and channel capital in the right direction right now. Thank you, Carmen. I'm, uh, I'm aware that we've had a huge discussion. I'm going to give Mike a, a chance to say something in a sec. I, the, we could have probably taken, spent several more hours exploring all the different avenues that I think have been raised. And I'm aware in, in each one of your inputs, we could uh, take a lot more time. Very quick, Mike, can you give us a quick point? Because we need to move on and stop. We have three minutes left. Well, this is going to be a closer on practical action. So taking on board Jose Luis's point that we do need substantial capital reallocation to achieve sustainable development. There are some investors that understand this and there are going to be many more as a result of COVID-19. What companies need to do now is they need to get out there and find those good reallocating investors. They need to find the individuals at each investment firm that's prepared to reallocate and make investment decisions based on sustainability factors. They then need to set up meetings, the sort of meetings that Jose Luis is talking about, you know, five a month with those sustainability investors. This is an incredible opportunity to do, to develop these relationships by Zoom because we've moved to a Zoom world. If we can develop those relationships, regular detailed meetings, you can ignore all of the data requests that are going to come through at the same time. This is about communicating your company to the investors. If you build those relationships now, then they will sustain when we move back towards whatever the new normal will be. So I think it's, a, it's an opportunity for companies to build a better relationship um, with investors around these things. Mike, that's fantastic. A beautiful exp exploration of the action that can be taken. We're going to hand back to, and thank you so much, everyone, for a, a fantastic conversation that could well have uh, taken us in some amazing new directions uh, and, uh, and apologies for the lack of time that we have to explore those things but thank you so much to everyone. Uh, Rodney can I hand back to you? Yes thank you very much yes indeed thank you to the panelists for their their conversations I think a few closing remarks for me of course I agree that my businesses need to get better at having conversations with investors but investors have to want to listen and this is a two-way dialogue, it is not a one-way monologue. And I think up until now, many of the members of the WBCSD have been frustrated that the uh, signals that they are uh, um, aware of and have been communicating about ES and G um, have been uh, sidelined for short-term uh, financial return. Um, and so I think we're now in a situation where we need to move away from the uh, White House style briefings of blame games into meaningful dialogue and meaningful conversations between investors and companies and to focus on resilience and to focus on recovery that includes uh, positive benefits, not only for financial stability, but for um, environmental and social uh, impacts and reform our governance mechanisms to ensure that those charged with governance uh, have companies and those that manage them focus on that as part of their work. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, just wanted to let you know that we have recorded today's session and it will be available. Uh, for those of you that have registered for the webinar, you'll receive that within the next two days. But I should also say that there is a whole range of information that you can get as part of our COVID-19 projects. Um, you can turn to the WBCSD.org website and you will find quite a large uh, volume of work that's there. In addition to that, we're hosting webinars later this week that will help businesses navigate some of the legal community and then the uh, legal issues associated with COVID-19 from an employee and privacy perspective. Also, as part of our virtual um, uh, sessions, uh, we're offering um, four more sessions over the next few weeks um, relating to ESG topics, um, three of them by WBCSD and one by PRI. Um, so on, on the 13th of May, on Wednesday, 
my colleagues will focus on TCFD learnings and next steps. So where are we with the TCFD? What can the company do to implement its recommendations? And what are the opportunities and challenges presented by the TCFD recommendations? On the 14th of May, the PRI will uh, offer a, a webinar um, to, for those that are interested in joining that. I have posted um, the uh, joining instructions on the chat function. Please do, uh, if you want to get there, copy that link so that you have it. On the 19th of May, we'll be looking at immunizing your employees for 1K plans. So um, it sounds very Americanized, but uh, this is really around trans, uh, um, this is very much around, um, you know, in, uh, immunizing uh, pension schemes towards ESG related issues. And then on the 20th of May, um, we'll be looking at how to modernize governance, uh, particularly looking at how to re-engage uh, directors on the challenges ahead. So without further ado, it just leaves me to say a huge thank you to um, Carmen and the gentlemen for their uh, participation in the panel today and to Joss for his moderation and to wish you wherever you are in the world a wonderful day. Thank you very much.